This is a Rattle and Hum Sports podcast for Wednesday, May the 29th, the year 2013. I'm Brian Houston, and with us right now talking Texas Rangers baseball is the man who covers the Rangers for Rattle and Hum Sports, Dick Humphrey. How you doing, Dick? I'm fine. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks very much for coming on with us, as always. Uh, the Rangers uh, had the day off on Tuesday. It sounded like they needed it after a, a three-game losing streak, dropping a doubleheader on Monday uh, to Arizona. Talk a little bit about uh, the state of the Rangers right now. Well, injury-wise, there's a flurry of news today. Uh, Colby Lewis, for starters, has been taken off of his rehab medical rehab assignment. Um, neither one of his two starts had gone very well. His fastball was clocked only in the mid-80s, and uh, he's going to be shut down for two weeks and then uh, perhaps start a, a new um, uh, rehab assignment at that point in time. Uh, Ian Kinsler is, uh, has been tested, and he is still a couple of weeks away from returning um, with this ribcage injury. Um, the, the pitching matchups have been, or the pitching rotation for the Rangers have been set for this weekend, and it's going to be Tepish on Friday against Kansas City, uh, Martin Perez on Saturday, and uh, Darvish on Sunday, which is a little bit curious. Darvish and Perez both pitched Monday in the doubleheader. They were the two starting pitchers. Uh, so it's interesting that, Dar- that they're given the extra day of rest to Darvish instead of to Perez. Uh, Is that because of the high pitch counts he's had the, the last three or four outings? Well, they haven't made that clear, but it, that sounds like a reasonable assumption. All right. Still so interesting after defending their decision to send him out there uh, a couple games ago against Detroit with that 10-4 to lead. We're seeing a trend here with Darvish, and we always seem to spend most of our time talking about you, Darvish, but he's been kind of the story of the year for the Rangers. Um, uh, again, on Monday in that doubleheader game, uh, he looked like he was in command going to the eighth inning. He had a 4-2 to two lead, uh, but then gave up the lead and lost the ball game. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that here in the last few outings, he seems to get off to a slow start and give up a couple of runs and then have to pitch out of a hole. A trend? Uh, it's hard to say. I, I'm kind of wondering about the uh, the pitch calling. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, last week or, or last Monday in the start against Arizona, they had scouted something because those first two batters hit the first two pitches, and it was single and triple, and a run was in, and the second one scored later, and the Rangers were in the two to nothing hole, just like you were talking about. But, that damage was done on two pitches, so it makes you wonder if there's some predictability to uh, to the uh, pitch calling that uh, other teams have picked up on. And that's amazing when you think about the fact that Darvish can throw about ten different kinds of pitches, how anybody could get a read on that uh, with the, the variety of pitches he has is kind of confounding. Well, and that might be what the problem is. It seems like it takes him maybe a couple of innings to figure out which pitches are working, and then he starts boiling it down to uh, three pitches or maybe four, and, and he gets stronger. But in the beginning, he'll throw the whole uh, kitchen sink at him. Well, is that a case of maybe uh, overthinking things? Uh, are there three or four pitches he needs to go out with and, and just focus on those, or, or does that limit him and not make him the you Darvish that we know and love then? Well, I think it's a matter of just trying to get a feel for what's working. It, it does surprise me that they can't seem to get a better feel for that, though, uh, through uh, the warm-up process before the game. But um, you know, that does seem to be the – his his ERA is something like nine in the first inning, and then it's below, well below two for all the other innings. Um, so it's a, you've, you've definitely spotted a, a trend there. Well, uh, one thing that we do, the other trend that you can't miss is the fact that he had 14 strikeouts in the game. I mean, he he's just unbelievable when it comes to striking out batters. Oh, once he got going, it was just incredible. Uh, it, I mean, uh, you know, uh, he didn't he didn't uh, 
finished the uh, the eighth inning, but 14 uh, strikeouts is almost two per per inning, and he, he was just mowing them down. It was incredible. All right, so now with that news about Colby Lewis being shut down for two more weeks, what was your take, first of all, on uh, Perez and his performance, the first performance of the regular season uh, after suffering the broken arm and, and having to miss the, the uh, first part of the year? How would you feel like he did? Well, he looked to me like he was not ready. He, he'd made four starts. I think one was actually a medical rehab start, and then they took him off the assignment and just optioned, optioned him to, to uh, the minor leagues, and, and he made three more starts after that. The last one uh, had been pretty dominating, but it was still a little strange to me that they didn't go with Ross Wolf. Um, Wolf had pitched that really nice game uh, the previous Wednesday, uh, the last game at home uh, before that road trip. Uh, one thing about it, if you start two right-handers or two left-handers in a doubleheader, it sure makes it hard for the other team to naturally play their platoons and, and rest a lot of their players. Uh, so when you start one of each, like the Rangers did, you certainly make it easier for the uh, other team uh, to uh, to play their platoons and rest, uh, play play a number of them just nine innings in the day. So uh, um, Wolf would have been, if Wolf had pitched instead of Perez, it would have been two right-handers, and it would have been a little more difficult for um Kirk Gibson to figure out who who he was going to play. It would have forced some decisions on him. What do you think the thinking was going behind bringing Perez up instead of going with Wolf? It makes you wonder if there wasn't another agenda. Um, It makes you wonder if maybe they were showcasing him for something down the line. Are you talking about Perez or Wolf? Yes, Perez. Okay. Uh, I think they, they, for whatever reason, they really wanted him up here and wanted him to to get his feet on the ground and, and against some major league hitters. So you think? And maybe they just figure with this uh, Kobe Lewis situation not going well, they they need him uh, to be in the rotation here. But he could have made a couple more starts in the minor leagues prior to uh, coming up, and he would have been just fine. So. It, it, it did seem like there was some other motivation for wanting up here. All right, is that motivation uh, to possibly try to bring in another bat, or are they looking to you know float in to see what kind of interest there is in him out there? Um, probably to see what kind of interest uh, to if they. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's talk of, of maybe Cliff Lee being available uh, among the big name starter and some package. Uh, um, of throwing in a, a pretty good looking arm and Perez would be that good looking arm to land such a package. So um, that's that's definitely a possibility. Uh, as as good as this team has played and is and is uh, really uh, up until I, I guess the A's have kept that lead to two and a half games now, but that, that lead was seven and a half games not too too long ago. Uh, as dominant as the Rangers have been, there's still a lot of holes. Uh, that need to be filled, and uh, um, so getting some prospects up here, making them look more attractive, uh, can only help in their quest uh, to uh, fit together uh, uh, to shore up the team in the next 60 days. Well, you mentioned the uh, the way that the race is tightening now in the AL West. I mean, back before the season started, nobody would have imagined that the uh, Rangers would be in first place here. Uh, as we uh, get ready to wind up May, uh, and uh, are we starting to see the real A's and the real uh, Angels now, the, the teams that are going to challenge and really go after this thing? Well, I've always been a believer in the A's. I, I picked them to win uh, the division at the, uh, before the year started, and I just felt like with their good pitching base and so much experience that those kids gained last year, and then getting people back like Bartolo Colon and and uh, Brett Anderson that they didn't have late in the season last year that this was a an A's team that would be very dangerous and uh, they kind of look like they're putting it together. Yeah. As for the Angels, I'm still just not a believer at all. There's so many holes in that pitching that you just can't see them 
ran, running off big winning streaks when they're throwing people out there like Joe Blanton to be in their starting rotation. Um, I'm, I'm just not on that Angels bandwagon yet. Even though they've won eight out of, eight out of their last ten? Uh, you know, it, it, every every team uh, is going to have a, a, a pretty good run at some point in time, and they've kind of come together with some decent pitch games and uh, um, and some and the hitting's been better. But uh, they lost uh, Monday when C.J. Wilson started, and they had a 6-1 lead early in that game, but they ended up losing. Uh, and he's supposed to be one of their, their better pitchers. So I still think they have really significant pitching problems. They're just on a little hot streak, and it'll, it'll go away. The A's are something else, so they, they're a really solid team. Well, let's talk a little bit about this. Thing. It's kind of interesting that we're talking about a team in the Rangers right now that still have, uh, has the best record in the American League, and yet I sense some hand-wringing right now, uh, some worry about this ball club right now. I mean, how concerned should we be? Well, it's certainly uh, a, a lot different-looking ball club than even two weeks ago. There's certainly been a lot of turnover the, the bullpen. Derek Lowe's gone. Corey uh, uh, Burns was up here. He's been sent back down. Ross Wolf came up, uh, made the start, got shuttled to the bullpen for last weekend. Um, uh, Neil Cox has been just really impressive. Uh, but he gives them four left-handed uh, relievers, and that's too many. And you've got to think somebody's going to be departing uh, among those left-handers. And, and my dad is Joe, Joseph Ortiz. But uh, um, there's been a lot of turnover there. And you really in the bullpen, it's, it's performed well. It's got some good numbers. But there's it's with Cox, and he's now considered one of the winning parts. I mean, there's four good pitchers in that bullpen. With Nathan as the closer, uh, Robbie Ross and um, and Tanner Shepherds and Cots uh, to to get the ball from the starting pitcher to the closer. But boy, the rest of that bullpen is pretty much a hole right now. There's nobody. Fraser's not pitching well. Kirkman's not pitching well. Ortiz hasn't been very good. And uh, uh, I think it's something in some some form or fashion. John Daniels is going to be interesting. Um, possibly through a trade for a veteran reliever. And the interesting thing is I was reading today just uh, somebody just making the supposition that had Colby Lewis been able to come back and uh, be at full strength, there was some thought that Ogando might go back to the bullpen. Uh, Obviously that can't happen now, but uh, could that be a possibility down the line? Well, especially if they do acquire some big name um, pitcher, uh, someone of the ilk of Cliff Lee, um, then I think that's a possibility. But uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, you never know how, how these rookies are going to hold up over the long season, too. And, and, and really and truly, I know there's a Ogando has a lot of detractors, but his numbers have been very good, and he seems like he's getting a little better. And uh, he's developing his off speed pitches, and I think this guy needs to have a chance. Uh, I think his ERA is something like 308, and he's he's one he's four and he's, he's got a four and two record, and uh, this is not something you just toss away just because you pitch a lot more innings as a starter than you do in the bullpen. And uh, if he's going to pitch well, we'd like to have him out there more often. How would you feel about Cliff Lee coming back to Arlington? It's an interesting possibility. He was certainly very professional. Uh, when he was here, in retrospect, it's pretty obvious he wasn't going to come back, and yet he felt like he was a, a good uh, influence on the other pitchers that were on the staff. Uh, and certainly went about uh, working hard and, and gave a really good effort here, and he's done that in Philadelphia since he's been gone. And uh, um, I would think he would be extremely professional again if he came back. Now, talking about the offense, uh, it has kind of tailed off, and, and we've seen the, you know, the Rangers struggle against um, – well, it's, in, it's an interesting thing that, that they go after the aces and seem to pound on guys like Verlander, but then they go up against guys that you know very little about, like the pitchers they faced against Arizona, uh, and uh, they seem to be handcuffed. Uh, how do you explain that? 
It is strange, of course. I, I think they're starting to feel the loss, though, of Ian Kinsler. He, he was putting together a very solid season. And then having him consistently on base, having the threat of him um, stealing bases and, and advancing without using it out, uh, he, he's a pretty valuable offensive player. And uh, I think you can see the, uh, the Rangers are sort of missing there. I think uh, Murphy is batting second tonight. Uh, the uh, uh, Moreland has batted second. Uh, Profar has batted uh, second. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, Washington has sort of uh, he's moved Elvis from into that uh, leadoff spot, but uh, it's been sort of a, a rotation around that uh, um, second spot. So uh, it's it's. Uh, it's. Um, it, I, I do think Elvis. I, the point being that I do think excuse me, Ian is definitely a, a, a is, is missed. Uh, profile, by the way, is at second base tonight. Okay, very good. Um, any thoughts? Uh, obviously, the Rangers need some pitching help right now uh, because again, you're having to rely on rookies, and you just don't know how long you can get away with that. Uh, what about the thoughts about the Rangers maybe trying to get another bat? Well, I still think they're at least a one bat short, and uh, I haven't um, heard really any uh, uh, good rumors of who might be available out there, but uh, uh, there always seems to be a, a pretty good hitter, and, and the Rangers are an attractive team for a hitter to come to. You know? um, I guess it was 84, I guess, excuse me, 2004, the Rangers had that good, good team with them. The young kids and they they won 89 games and they made the trade for uh, Larry Walker and he just said no I'm not coming he had the 10 five rights and I think now you know, that's not going to happen I think now with this team uh, with the chance to to do some damage in the World Series uh, in the, in the playoffs maybe get to the World Series that this team is going to um, um, be a very attractive to a, a hitter to come. Uh, okay, there's also some talk of uh, uh, Joaquin Soria uh, stepping up and maybe being a, a a boost to the Rangers bullpen. What do you know about him? Well, I mean, he was once a very good closer for Kansas City with a terrific arm. Uh, this is his second Tommy John surgery. Um, they seem to think that he's going to, to, at some point in time, come back. I mean, there was speculation that he might even take over as early as later on this year for for Nathan as the uh, closer, but uh, uh, he's had a setback in his uh, rehabilitation. Now instead of uh, May, they're looking at July before he comes back. Uh, so all of these injuries seem to be taking a little bit longer than originally projected. Okay, so give us something <laughs> to, to be hopeful about with this Rangers team. Again, that's uh, got the best record in the American League, but it sure has been a downer kind of a day talking about some of the, the problems they're dealing with. What are some of the things to uh, to stay and well, remain excited about? It really is a, is a um, you know, I, I think perhaps the Ranger standards and, and Ranger fan standards have just gotten a little bit, um, maybe their expectations are too high. I mean, uh, for most teams to have a pitcher like Alexi Ogando at, uh, as the number three or four starter, teams would be overjoyed to have that quality of a pitcher at three or four. And Ranger fans are, you know, let's, let's get rid of that guy and move him to the bullpen. I don't think he's getting started. You hear this all the time. Uh, um, I think, uh, you know, there's, we just mentioned they've got four real good parts to that bullpen. There's a lot of bullpens that don't have four, that don't have anywhere near four. Wish they had four. So I think a lot of it is just the standards here. Uh, but, you know, this team has been um, a little bit uh, on and off, but it hasn't had just tremendous droughts like offensively like uh, last year's team could have, especially around Josh Hamilton. It's not going to be a, uh, a tremendous uh, home run hitting ball club. Um, but uh, you certainly, uh, Moreland is is playing extremely well and turning into the offensive player or, that had always been projected for him. Um, Cruz is streaked, and uh, he'll get another hot streak and carry this team for a couple weeks, and that's 
it'll it'll happen. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of when. And uh, certainly Berkman's been very consistent. He uses he's a he's a pitch burner up there. He he runs through a lot of pitches or. The Rangers are, are getting starters out earlier. There's a lot of good trends here. Uh, there really are. Uh, there's a, a, certainly for this Ranger team to have dominated when, uh, you know, there were a lot of ifs, and if a bunch of those ifs didn't come true, I mean, this is a team that might even sink below 500 when they've been, you know, they've been, they look anything from uh, far from being a bad team like that. So. Uh, this is this has been a really successful uh, third of the season, and uh, I think it's just going to continue to be a very successful season. All right, Dick, what's coming up on Rattle and Hum Sports as far as your Rangers coverage? Um, well, uh, we will have uh, the uh, Arizona series. Uh, this, uh, you know, they're here again, uh, but they're here in Arlington instead of uh, in Phoenix, and uh, so we'll have. Uh, have uh, that uh, the, tonight, tomorrow night's game covered uh, for Rattle and Hum, and then Kansas City this weekend. So, uh, and, and this team always seems to uh, to sort of bounce back when it's been on the road and suddenly have an offensive surge. So, uh, the weather's getting warmer in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and then usually that's the sign that the bats warm up and the home runs start flying out a little quicker. So, uh, uh, I'm optimistic about the offense this weekend. Well, we really appreciate your report. Thanks. A lot of great information today. A lot of uh, not so great news, but uh, again, it looks like this team has been resilient all year long, and so uh, there's no reason to believe they can't continue to to keep battling through some of this stuff the way they've done it so far. You're right. You're right. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Great to have you on, Dick Humphrey, covering the Texas Rangers for Rattle and Hum Sports. This is a Rattle and Hum Sports podcast. I'm Brian Houston. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.